Welcome back to another episode of Frenchie's Forge. Thanks for tuning back in with me and coming to spend your time with me. This week, we are going to be making another knife. I have an idea in mind that I think will be pretty cute. It's going to be a little version of a big knife. And it's going to be a little cutie. It's going to be the cutest little knife you've ever done seen, mate. Yeah, so... Anyway, before we get into that, I wanted to say thanks to my little brother for coming and spending the weekend with me. On the last episode, he made his very first knife. I think it turned out great. It was a super fun weekend, and I hope he had as much fun as I had. That weekend, which was yesterday, yeah, today's Monday, I'm, I should be at work, uh, but the weather's poop, so I'm here hanging out in the shop, having another shop day. Anyway, this last weekend with my brother made me think about some things. For one, the metal that he chose was 5160. Now this metal isn't necessarily a complicated metal. Lots of people use it um, for making knives. I personally have not had the chance to uh, try to heat treat it and make a knife out of it before this weekend. Um, and that was one thing that I kind of told him about going into it was, hey, I don't have a ton of experience working with this metal. And although the metal composition is somewhat similar, there's definitely differences, but um, it's supposed to be somewhat an easy process for a normal guy with a forge and that sort of thing to quench correctly or ostinatize correctly correctly. Um, so yeah, it just got me thinking. The The knife turned out good. We had a bit of an issue though um, while sharpening the uh, blade. There was a little bit of a roll in the edge and I thought, okay, well that's weird. That's never happened to me before. Um, I wonder what's going on. So um, doing a little bit of investigating and researching and trying to figure out kind of what went wrong. Now with the 10 series steel, like the 1080, 1084, um, I've also used 15 and 20, so the, basically those three, I do have moderate um, research and time put into to heat treating those steels. Um, and I feel pretty confident in my process with those. Um, but for 5160, for one, it requires a little bit slower of a quench medium. Um, you know, I think they recommend maybe Parks AAA, um, and I didn't have that. We had peanut oil, so we gave that a try. Um, and, you know, just kind of curious as to what, what uh, we could have done better. Is it a hard knife? Yes, it's hard. We have uh, testing files that we use to kind of gauge the hardness. It's definitely a hard blade. It was just in that one little spot that seemed to not be so great. Once we got past that spot and continued grinding, the apex stiffened right back up and it was, it, you could just tell the steel was hard there. So I don't know, I don't know what happened. Maybe it got overheated. Maybe the uh, grain structure was relatively bigger than it should have been, which may have caused it to act a little funny. I don't know. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely worth noting and talking about. You know, you can put your time, your effort, your craftsmanship, your heart and soul into making a knife, but if you don't get the heat treat right, then all you've done is you've spent all this energy in making a knife-shaped object. And you hear people in the um, in the, the whole bladesmithing realm talk about that, right? Like, it's super important. It's the heart and soul of making a knife is the heat treatment. Um, so it's important to discuss things. It's important to talk about your failures. Um, it's important to uh, research and, you know, get it out there. Hey, I'm not a professional. I never claim to be a professional, but I want to learn and uh, try to acquire more skills as time goes on. So, um, you know, one of the things in heat treatment that I feel like is so important is, is temperatures, uh, hold times, the 
uh, what you're using to quench in. How big is the container? How much volume of the quench medium do you have? Uh, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's just it's important to know what you're doing and to practice ahead of time. Um, you know, I just heard a quote today that, uh, you know, you have to, instead of panicking, you're supposed to practice. Uh, that didn't make any sense. Scratch the quote. <clears throat> anyway, so while Jack was making his knife, in the background, I took a scrap piece of his 5160 and I forged out a really rough blade shape and I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to quench this without thermocycling it. Now, what do I mean by thermocycling? If you know, then you know. And if you're not familiar with it, that is the process of reconditioning the steel um, to be more suitable prior to austenitizing, uh, prior to getting the steel hard. It needs to be in a certain state to achieve that maximum uh, strength and durability and toughness, etc. Um, so there's different processes that you do before you austenitize that then kind of set you up for better success. Um, one of which is normalizing, or you hear people uh, talk about thermocycling and grain reduction. Um, all that kind of falls under an umbrella. Um, but it is important. Um, and another term you might hear is annealing. And annealing is also uh, important, especially prior to doing a lot of work on the knife. You want to anneal the blade so that it's in its spheridized state, which then makes it softer, uh, more malleable, easier to drill through, that sort of uh, thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, annealing is pretty much bringing the steel to non-magnetic, um, at least with the steels that I've used, the 1080, 1084, um, and then you slowly let it cool over time, whether that be in the forge, uh, where you close it off and just let it slowly cool, um, or better yet, if you can get a bucket of vermiculite and stick it in there and just let it cool down to room temperature. Um, that then leads to spheridized carbides instead of perlite. And perlite is what you'd find in more of the normalized um, blade where it's not brought down slowly in heat. Um, but that does give you a softer metal structure to work with. Um, so these, these terms and these things are important to know uh, when you're making a knife and trying to achieve a certain desirable structure within the steel. Um, so anyway, I decided, okay, what happens when you forge out 5160 and you don't thermocycle it and refine the grain and etc. right? We don't put that extra effort into the steel before trying to quench it and harden it. Um, so we did that. Um, and let me see if I can pull you down here. I've got the blade that I... Uh, broke after we quenched it I broke and uh, then just wanted to peek inside of it to see what the grain looked like okay so here we have the blade that I forged out and I did grind in just some rough bevels to get it thin and we stuck it in the vise and broke it and there you can see the result of not thermocycling this would be uh, you know, v clearly very large grain structure, um, which is undesirable. You don't really want that. Uh, you want a nice, tight grain structure. Um, it just makes a tougher, harder steel. Um, so not that this isn't hard. The metal definitely got hard or else we wouldn't have been able to break it necessarily so easily. Um, it would have been more malleable and easily bent. Um, but, yeah, that's a great example of uh, really large grain. It looks like sand, and you can see a lot of sparkling in it. Um, and then over here to my left, I have put in uh, just a little clamp here, a piece of 1080 that I have heat treated and broke just to get an idea of what the difference is uh, in terms of what it looks like. So you have more of a matte you know, to almost like a, just a dull gray look. 
Um, and that is the desired effect that we're trying to reach. Uh, now, is grain structure the most important thing in a knife blade? Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe arguably not. Um, but it's definitely, definitely important. You don't want large grain because uh, that's just not good. Um, so typically we're going to be shooting for something like that. So, as you can see, that there's a big difference in between um, a properly heat-treated blade and one that has uh, been neglected or not heat-treated properly. Uh, the inside of the blade, it's, it's different. The structure of the metal is different. So, that brings us to normalizing and why normalizing is so important, especially for people who forge steel, um, people that do stock removal, uh, you know, you buy your steel online and it probably comes in a spheridized state. It depends on where you get it, I guess, but um, it's either been normalized or annealed typically um, and has a relatively low rock well to begin with. Um, so, you know, you also, when you buy the steel, you're not, you, you kind of, you're buying it with the intent on making a knife, it hasn't been under somebody's truck like a leaf spring taking a bunch of stress and all that stuff. So um, it is, I feel like, important uh, to normalize the steel uh, before quenching it, whether you're doing stock removal or forging, but especially for forging. Um, and really, when you're normalizing and thermocycling the blade, I feel like the number one thing that you're trying to do is to dissolve all of the carbides throughout the steel and so that they can be evenly distributed. That might be the first most important. The second might be reducing the grain. Um, I feel like those are the two things that you're trying to accomplish when normalizing. Um, I just recently got this book for Christmas. Very good book. Some of it is a little confusing. Um, I not a metallurgist and some of the terms I kind of have to say okay I'm going to slow down and think about this but once you do there's a ton of great information in here um, and definitely recommend this book or something like it to help with your journey of figuring out your heat treats super duper important it also goes into edge geometries and other things like that um, but anyway that's kind of a long-winded intro <laughs> Sorry about that, but I feel like it's important to talk about, you know, um, you see a lot of things on YouTube and you don't see a whole lot of people talk about their mistakes um, or show their mistakes or, um, you know, really try to make it a learning environment or atmosphere. And a big part of this channel uh, that I, the whole reason I wanted to do it was to just kind of help people learn and help people with the beginning journey of knife making. Um, I'm still learning myself and I feel like it's important to talk about some of these issues. So hopefully I didn't just bore you to death, um, but if I did, then so be it. I know the people that wanted to hear that are still listening um, and it's important. So anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's get back to what we got on the table. We're going to be making this week a little tiny big knife hey mate it's a little biggie is it a big little knife or a little big knife i don't know anyway just kind of goofing off with this idea but i thought okay let's make a really big blade shape smaller and put a little tiny baby handle on it it's gonna be the cutest little knife you ever saw mate cut 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 it's gonna cut 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 yeah so, I don't know, just winging it out here. I like my uh, little brother's uh, words of advice. Just wing it, bro. So, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to wing it, and we're going to make a little big knife. Let's do it. All right, so we're going to pick up right about here. I uh, put the blank onto a piece of metal, got it cut out, profiled, and just kind of roughly ground in some preheat treat bevels. Uh, figured we would start here since, um, you know, those steps are pretty self-explanatory. Um, now we're going to turn our attention to 
the shoulders here of the tang or the ricasso and uh, we're going to get these filed down to where they're even using this file guide um, and then that way we can stick a little tiny piece of brass on this little tiny big knife So I was looking back through some of the clips uh, that are going to be this video and uh, looks like we started on Monday. Today is now Saturday morning so it's been several days. Um, I've got a haircut and slept a few times but in between that time I, I haven't had a whole lot of time to come out here but we are now pretty much ready to move on from the guard step. We've got that fitted up pretty well and uh, we Put it in the vise and beat it and you can see the outline here of the knife ramming into the brass when i hit it with the hammer super hard sometimes you have to uh, to get it to fit good you just hit it really really hard with the hammer and uh, that tends to work out sometimes anyway so now that we're there and i've picked out the other little piece of handle material to go in between here um, we're ready to drill the hole for this little baby knife. Um, before we do that, I did want to show off a couple of things that I got from a friend that I haven't heard from in a while. His name's John. Um, he called me up the other day and said he had a bunch of these walnut chunks um, that he acquired through his work. I'm not sure exactly what he was doing with them, but... He had an entire Twix box full of these things. Um, yeah, I say Twix box, so I literally mean a giant Twix box. <laughs> uh, yeah, he uh, pulled this out of the back of his truck, and I was like, oh, dang, man, you're not kidding. You got a ton of that stuff. So um, there's all kinds of pieces to choose from in here. And uh, I just thought it was really cool that he thought of me and said, you know what, I'm going to call this dude and give him some walnuts. So uh, anyway, I really appreciate that, man. Thanks for thinking of me. I'm definitely going to be using this stuff in a knife build. Uh, and in fact, I still have the file that you gave me. Um, and so 
I thought a cool way to say thanks would be to take that file and maybe incorporate this walnut and make you a Xing Xing. So I'm going to get that done. I don't know how long it'll take me, but uh, as soon as I do, I'll hit you back up and I'll uh, give you some cutlery. Some cutlery, mate. I'll give you a piece of cutlery. I don't know if it'll be a little tiny baby knife. It might be. It might be a tiny little baby knife. I'm not sure. But maybe it won't be. Maybe it'll be a rather big raspy chopper. Aye, mate. Nobody knows at this point, mate, because I haven't made up my mind. But I will make you a knife, all right, mate? I will, all right? You've cornered me, mate, and I will, all right? I will do it. Yeah, so anyway, enough being goofy. Let's get back to working on this little tiny big knife and uh, continuing along with the steps and getting this thing done. Let's do it. All right, so we got this thing clamped down in the drill press, and we're ready to pop a hole in the wood. So now that we got the pin hole put into our handle here and the pin put through, we now have our handle ready to rock and roll. The next steps for this thing are going to be heat treating the blade, gluing up the handle and shaping the handle, and then putting an edge on it for our completed little tiny big knife. I'll probably save those steps for the next episode. If I was to put it all in this one, it'd be a rather lengthy episode. Um, so we'll probably save that and make this a two-parter, at least for this particular knife. Um, if you're still watching to this point, let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts are on my style of videos. What do you like about them? What don't you like about them? Do you like where I go in depth and talk and explain about the processes of knife making? Do you like it when I'm quiet and I just show clips of me making knives. Um, it'd be good for me to know what what the audience likes. Um, and if anybody's even still at this point watching, you know, uh, that would be good to know. I don't know, maybe people just kind of skip around and watch, which is fine, whatever. I just want to be able to provide the type of either education or entertainment that people want. So if you do me the favor, write in the comments below what you would like to see more of or less of in my videos. Um, this thing is going to be super cool and I cannot wait to uh, get it finished in the next episode. It's also important and uh, worth noting that we made this entire thing out of scrap pieces. The metal was scrap, the brass was scrap, the blue chunk was off of the farrier's rafts knife, the green chunk was left over from the hidden tang that I made for my cousin. It's all just leftover pieces, and we created something really cool out of it. Um, and in fact, this green piece that came off the hidden tang, uh, my cousin just sent me a picture uh, of the knife that he used while he was hunting and uh, cleaned up a deer with it, which was pretty sweet. I'll try to put a picture of it up here. Hopefully that just popped up. Um, really, really cool picture. And it's awesome to know that the work that I'm putting out there, I mean, right now to friends and family, but at least it's getting used and it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, cutting, which, you know, that's what we doing out here. We be trying to make stuff to cut stuff. So anyway, um, yeah, that is really awesome. He sent me that picture. Luke, I appreciate it, buddy. And I'm glad that the knife is getting put to use. And I'm glad it's cutting for you. Um, that makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm doing something right. Um, anyway, yeah, so this would be the bin of scraps that I have collected thus far. I've made uh, this knife here, the little baby knife, probably knife number 22 that I've made in my entire life, so I don't have a ton of knives under my belt. Um, but this is the bin that I save all the handle scraps and stuff. And if I was to not save this, then this knife would not be possible. So I think it's really cool to save your stuff and 
and uh, draw inspiration from the leftovers to make another thing. Anyway, I really appreciate you guys watching. Hopefully you found this educational and entertaining. Let me know in the comments what you guys think, and I'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. Frenchy Forge, out.